Okay. So that's day two. And just for a recap, what we saw yesterday. So this is the part that we saw yesterday. So you found out how to go from the fast few files to having a count matrix. Then you did understand what are the QCs that you have to look at in order uh, to remove, for instance, dying cells or doublets. And then we went on to uh, discuss a little bit about the normalizations that you should be using in your data set. And then how you can do feature selection and how you could uh, remove confounding factors with the regress out uh, in the scaling data. So now today will be about this part here mainly, I guess, until probably here, uh, where we will try to understand how we can now visualize our data and how we can understand what are the cells that we have in our data. This is what we will be uh, aiming for today. And so for understanding how you can go from the count matrix to something visual, we will actually go to having uh, to discuss about dimensionality reduction methods. Oops. Okay, so what's dimensionality reduction reduction about? So what you're trying to to gain is to simplify the complexity of your data set, so uh, it becomes easier to work with. So the idea would be that you start with a huge data set where you have all of your cells and all of your genes, and what you want to end up with is that you still have all of your cells, but that you have something that you might be able to visualize, like two dimension or something that you might be able to um, grasp to make the, the data set easier to work with for some methods. So the idea would be that you try to find out what is the redundancy that you have in your data. So you would like to remove this redundancy. You would like to identify uh, the most relevant information. You would like to filter the noise and just keep what's uh, informative. And the idea would be also to reduce computational time for downstream procedures, because uh, indeed there are actually many functions that uh, you can use that rely on the fact that you have a, low, a smaller data set because they are not able to compute otherwise. So you need to reduce computational time for, for the, the, the downstream procedure. Then you can also facilitate clustering if you have already uh, removed the redundancy in your data set and only kept the most relevant information. Uh, and uh, some algorithms actually struggle with many dim dimensions. So it's nice that you uh, help facilitating clustering. But most of all, what you're trying to aim for is to be able to visualize your data. And visualize your data is, uh, as I said before, that you would like to go to two dimensions or at most, let's say, three dimensions, such that you will be able to plot it and visualize it. So um, I think if I can uh, go out of this and then share my screen again, the internet, and then I will go just for you to see it. There is a web page with um, which is called singlecellrnatools.org. Um, I think it's quite relevant for uh, working single cell RNA sec because it's a sort of repository where uh, most of the new tools that come out in single cell RNA sec are actually uh, put there, and uh, they, are, they have been categorized in thirty categories, and so you can have a look at actually the tools which are used for visualization, the tools that are used for dimensionality reduction, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can click uh, on it. And here you can actually sort by whatever is interesting for you. So now we're talking about dimensionality reduction. If I may click it. Ah, doesn't want me to click. OK, it's loading. <laughs> After loading, you can click on whatever is interesting for you. So for instance, dimensionality reduction, and then you can filter. And what's nice about it, again, it needs to load. It should, should be faster. I guess it's because I'm online uh, on Zoom at the same time. But you have then all of the tools that are uh, for dimensionality reduction in single cell RNA sec. And then you can have a look at what these methods are, and if they are in R or in Python or whatever, 
and then you can can see also how many people downloaded it for instance so how popular the tool is so here this one you see it has 73 downloads per month for instance this one has 272 per month so which is tisne uh, and then you have those which are uh, much higher and then you can also see if it's in bioconductor or not and this is quite helpful in understanding what are the tools that are, that are there you can click on on one let's take this one and then you have a small description of it you can see where you can find the code you can see if it's python based r based etc and you can see the licenses and how how long it has been uh, there you can also see something quite interesting is the number of citations because this is maybe telling you how popular the tool is so that's just for the single cell RNA uh, tools. And now I can go back to my presentation, uh, which was here. And then you can see here, so for dimensionality reduction, you can see the, the number of tools that exist or that are in this repository right now, 348. So for sure, we will not discuss these 348 tools today. Uh, I chose the most popular ones and the ones that are actually inside Surat. Uh, and try to explain to you how they work, such that you have a general understanding of what you should be careful about and what are the parameters and how you can then um, change them and in, in which situation. So in Surat, as I said, this is what we are aiming, uh, that we will be using uh, today. There are these three tools that are used mainly. So it's principal component analysis, PCA, which has been there for hundreds of years already. Uh, there is TISNI, which is a T distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding, and UMAP, which is uniform manifold approach and projection. We will be discussing these three tools, but such that you already know how you can do them in Surat, it's quite easy. It's called run PCA, run TISNI, and run UMAP. And we will be practicing those in, in the exercises. So ah, I have now a VVOX question. 26, 27, okay. So which dimensionality reduction are you mostly used to? So is it UMAP, is it TISNI, is it others, or were you not aware about any of these dimensionality reduction methods? So I can stop it. So UMAP is the most popular one. There are some which are used to TISNI. There are some which said others, and uh, some people are not, not really familiar with any dimensionality reduction methods. So I guess uh, this course will be quite useful for you. I'm quite curious if one person wants to speak up about the other methods that you are used to. Should I have included PCA in one of the answers? Yeah, uh, yeah for me, it's PCA. PCA, OK. I will add this. So PCA is the first one I will discuss. So it's nice that you actually are used to that. Maybe you already know all about it. But I just wanted to uh, make you aware about what PCA is really about. And just for you to understand also what uh, Surat will be uh, uh, telling you as an output, such that you can understand what is going on there. So PCA is a method that is based on the variance in your data, and it's actually just a, a way to change the original axis into a new axis system. So it's really just the best angle to see and evaluate the data. And the new axis that you will generate are actually linear combination of the original axis. So it's a linear method. And how can you actually choose these new axis to look at your data and how are they determined? So it's an optimization procedure, and that's why sometimes it's already part of the machine learning algorithms. Uh, and it, this is how it works. So what it will try to do, so this would be like your original data set, and it's a dumb one where you would have only two genes. So this is not what we are actually doing, but this is for you to be able to visualize what we are, uh, what we are doing in PCA. I will take a two-dimensional data set, and I will change it into a two-dimensional data set. So here is how it looks like. You will have your two genes, gene one and gene two. 
This is uh, the all of your cells, how they are distributed. And what you will do is that you will tr first try to find the axis where you have the most variance in your data. And you can see that the the where your data mostly spreads into is this direction. So this will be your first axis, Z1. And then your second axis will be actually an orthogonal axis to the first one. And uh, the two choices or the choices that you would have here would be to have this one or the one starting here and coming out of your computer. But as you can see, the data is only moving in this direction. So this, the second best axis to choose once you have determined this variation would be that one. And so that's how you will define your second axis. Now, um, once you have understand where is the most variance, you can actually say, uh, describe that axis with the original axis system. So the original axis system were E1 and E2. And now you can determine how you would uh, have this axis in your original axis system. So it will be, you go two times in the direction of E1, then one time 0.7 in the direction of E2. And this will be now your new axis system for the first axis. Then the second one will be an orthogonal or uncorrelated axis to the first one. And it's where you have the second most variation. So this is the one. And here you would go one time in the direction of your original axis E1 and 1.2, this time minus, you go down. Uh, in the direction of E2. And this will be your, now your new axis. So what's important to know is that uh, the axis is now going to this direction, but it could actually have gone into that direction as well. So some people will, you will see in the exercises, some people will actually get the reverse picture of what we have uh, in our solution. This is not a problem. It's still the same uh, principle uh, component analysis or the same, same projection, it's just the direction of the axis might be uh, the opposite. So this will be your axis system. And then you can actually uh, uh, project now your points into this new axis system, which are your two axes, V1 and V2. And some uh, principal component analysis method actually then uh, will put these axes on the side. This can also happen. or you can have that the, the middle point will be actually in the middle of your data. So this is just a way to, to, to plot it. Mathematically speaking, and this is a slide that you can maybe uh, put on the side if you want to. So what it's actually doing is that it's calculating the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. And this is actually the di direction of the axis. So uh, that uh, will be um, calculated where you have the most variance. So this is what you are doing. And then you have the eigenvalues, which are corresponding to these eigenvectors. So these are uh, the coefficient attached to the eigenvectors. And these are actually telling you how much variance is carried by this principal component. In um, a data set where you would calculate all the principal component analysis, you can actually understand the proportion of variance carried by each of the principal component. So you can know that uh, here, for instance, PC1 has 22% of the variance that is carried by PC1. Then PC2 has 20% of the variance that is carried by the PC2, etc., etc. This you would just do by taking the eigenvalue of each principal component associated to the principal component and divide by the sum of all of these eigenvalues. So this is what you would be able to gain. And um, adding these uh, proportion of variance up will tell you the proportion of total or cumulative variance that is carried by all of the PCs. So for instance, if you include PC1 and PC2 in your data, in your um, projection, then you will already have covered 42% of all of the variance in your data, et cetera, et cetera. And you could go on to select only 80%, for instance, of variance of the data. 
and say that the rest is maybe noise, can be forgotten about. So then you will look at this graph and see, okay, I need to actually include eight principal components such that I carry most of the variance in my data. And so you have reduced the complexity of your data set. In R, um, run PCA actually um, is not able to compute or is a, a fast way to compute principal component analysis and is an approximation of principal component analysis where you will actually not compute all the principal components, but just a subset. And by default, the subset, I think in the newer version of Surat is 50 principal components. And so since it's just an approximation of the principal component, you can actually not calculate the percentage of variance carried by each of the PCs, but you can actually make a graph with the eigenvalues. Since the eigenvalues of each of the principal components represent the, uh, is correlated to, to the variance carried by each of the, of the PCs, this is enough to understand when, when is it that you have informative uh, principal component and when is it that you have noise. So in terms of mm, mathematics, there has been this uh, elbow plot that has been uh, described as a way to select which are the principal components that you would like to keep in your data such that you have informative uh, understanding of your uh, the variance in your data. And this is how it works. So you would plot these eigenvalues which are related to each of the principal components. And you will consider this to be an arm where you want to figure out where is the elbow of this arm. And here you can see uh, the elbow would be around this or this point. And so you would know that you should include, and I'm sorry it's cut here, you would have to include actually four principal components and that the rest is starting to be flat. So the amount of information that you would gain by adding each of those PCs would be just uh, almost the same since it's starting to get flat. It's where you have the, the, the underarm. And so this is where you will get less and less information by adding those uh, PCs. So this would be where you could consider it to be noise. And here is where you would consider it to be informative. So, Run PCA will have an output, a message, which is quite important. It's, in, it's telling you what are the genes that mostly contribute to this, the PCs positively and negatively. And this is something I would really love you to understand because it's where you should actually uh, have a, a look. So these are actually the, the, the linear parameters that have been computed to understand in which direction you should go. So if we go back to our uh, easy example here, you, we had only two genes and two dimensions, but we know that uh, the, sec the second, or let's start with the first, we know that the first principal component goes two times in the direction of E1 and 1.7 times in the direction of E2. So we know it actually goes more into the direction of gene one than of gene two but we know that it's almost equal. Now you could imagine that uh, maybe your first principal component goes a lot into the direction of a certain gene and much less into the direction of other genes. So then you would know that what's mostly represented by this principal component is that gene which, which has a very high, and this is what we call loading actually of this uh, gene. Now, you could um, use what we call a rotation matrix, which is just how to go from the first two axis or first n axis to the new axis system and how you go from the first axis system to the, to the next axis system is just by understanding these parameters here. And so this is what you would uh, like to, to do and to use to understand what the principal components represent. So what I want you to, to understand is you will reduce dimension. So since you will reduce dimension, you will only go uh, or describe dimension where you have most of the variance. So you will have lost some information. Now, 
run PCA gives you actually the contribution of the different genes for each of the PCs such that you can understand that if you would like to very well distinguish, for instance, T cells versus B cells, and that you have a gene that you definitely know is accounting for T cells and is only represented in PC number five by this uh, output message, then maybe you should also include uh, PC number four and five to understand this difference and to very well separate your T cells from your uh, other cell types. So this message is quite important, and this is something we will try to practice also in the exercises and have a look. So here is just what I said out loud before. I would like you to understand that PCs, uh, so the principal components are actually linear combination of the original axis. The estimated parameters of this linear combination is known, and therefore uh, we can know the genes that are positively or negatively uh, related to those um, PCs. So this is what I said. You have your original axis, which are your genes, gene 1, gene 2, gene 3, and it goes up to gene 12,000, for instance. And the new axis system is a combination of those uh, original axes. So it's a certain times the direction of gene 1, plus A2 times gene 2, plus A3 times gene 3 for the first axis. Then the same thing for the second axis, etc., etc. And the AIs that are the most high uh, positive and negative are therefore the genes which are mostly represented by this axis that you see. By uh, default, I think it might be 30 and not 10. Uh, I will have to, to check again. Uh, the most highest positive and negative values are displayed in R with the Surat package, but you can make that number bigger. You could also access those genes if you want. And one observation I uh, really press here is that scaling is super important for principal component analysis. Indeed, if you would not scale, then you would have some genes which are in, in a much bigger scale, so I'd have a much higher uh, um, variants and so would be the genes that are mostly contributing to the, the different axes. And so what you would see is that what would dominate the PCA procedure is mostly the, the genes which are uh, most highly expressed and not the genes which have the highest uh, variance if you scale them. And so it's quite important to scale the data before going to PCA, but this is what we already practiced yesterday. It's uh, PCA, what it does and what it does not do. So it is a linear method. So it's nice because then you can really interpret it, what it's doing. Uh, it, the, the top principal component, they contain the highest variance from the data and it can be used for filtering. But how you do that, there are several ways of doing it. Uh, and uh, some people prefer to, uh, to take the PCs that would explain at least 1% of the variance and take all of them. Some use some methods that actually give you p-values. There is a method that is called the Jack Straw method, which is giving you p-values of how important each principal component is, and some people use that. Some people would always use the first 5 to 10 PCs, and some people would actually uh, use what I said before, the elbow plot. There is also some packages that will enable you to do correlation between principal components and metadata, such that maybe you would include all the PCs until the metadata information is covered. This might also be something that you would like to, to use um, for representation. What's important to understand is that there is a little problem, is that the two first principal components in single-cell RNA-seq oftentimes would only account for a very few percent of the total variance. So this is something very different from RNA-seq, where RNA-seq, you would usually have the first two principal components that account for enough variance such that you have a good visualization of your data. Here, it's not the case. So only including two principal components, so only visualizing with two principal components is not enough to uh, understand the variability in your single cell or any uh, data. It's not enough such that we are actually want to use a second method 
of dimensionality reduction after PCA, because PCA is quite powerful to remove um, data set that is correlated. So genes that are super correlated, these will be re re removed by PCA. PCA is also quite powerful in order to um, go only into the direction where you have the most variance, so where you have most information. So it is redu reducing also the complexity of your data set like that. However, using only two PCs is not enough to well represent your data. Okay. I guess that was enough on the PCA. So I have, um, so I'm happy to take questions at any moment. Uh, feel free to, to interrupt or to ask. Where is it? Ah, okay. So the next question is the following. Should I again enlarge this because I see 20 people? So this is about seeing if you understood what I said, and I'm happy to repeat if the answer is wrong. So feel free to also put a wrong answer in case it's anonymous. I see 27 people. So the idea is to understand what are these genes that are associated with PC1 positively and negatively, those which would be output by the Surat method. Are these actually correlation scores between PCs and the gene expression? Are these genes with the highest and lowest value calculated with the rotation matrix? Or are these differentially expressed genes positively and negatively that are associated with PC1 versus all the other principal components? So differential expression, uh, rotation matrix, or correlation. Few more seconds. Okay, perfect. Okay, so it's correct. Most of you understood that it's this rotation matrix, so the matrix which enables you to pass from the first set of axes to the new set of axes. The correlation score was uh, wrong, although sometimes it is true that the PC uh, location and the gene expression is correlated, but this is not uh, the case. It's not what is calculated. There is also no differential expression that is calculated between PC1 and the other PCs. So there's not such a thing as a p-value that is given. It's just a matter of loadings. I think the next question is about integration. Yes, OK. So. Um, I go back to my presentation. So that was for PCA. And now I will go back. I will tell you something about TSNI. Some people, some of you answered still that they are used to see TSNI plots. And uh, just for you to understand what it's all about. So these were the two scientists involved in uh, describing the, this algorithm, the T distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding algorithm with their original paper, which I really find difficult to understand. And here you have a um, YouTube video um, of stat question with Josh Starmer. It's a YouTube channel where uh, he tries to describe some statistical question or some questions the followers have. And he actually describes how TSNI works. And you will see that some of the pictures that I have next are actually inspired by what he has uh, described in his YouTube channel. So the idea of TSNI is quite simple and it's non-linear this time. So this is a quite a different uh, approach. What it's, it's actually model-based, you will see how. And what you do is that you start with a data set. Here I again show a two-dimensional data set. 
And what you want to gain is a uh, lower or a, a reduced dimension, pro, uh, projection in a reduced dimension, and which keeps still the structure of the clusters that you have in your original data set. What it does is that it will randomly project the points in your lower dimension. And since I say randomly project, it's quite important to have a, a seed of how this random projection works. And then it will move the points little by little closer to the, the points that they were close to in the original data set. So that's the general idea. And what's important to know is what, is mean, what it means to be close in the original space. And this is what I will describe now. So close in the original space is based on a distribution. And the way you, uh, you do this, the distribution on the points is actually like that. So you will take a point and you will take a normal distribution around that point. So the normal distribution has a mean, which is the point here itself. And the variance will be given by um, which what we call sigma b, so is dependent on the point and is dependent on the density of points around this point. So you will take a normal distribution, just make a normal distribution means that most of the points are in the red circle. You have a little bit less points in the blue circle and then even less point in the green circle and very unlikely points in the white part here. What it means by that is that you will calculate a probability of being um, inside that distribution, so inside that uh, circle. So it's you should have you should be a neighbor of this point. It's very likely if you are in the red circle. It's less likely if you are in the blue circle. It's uh, even less likely in the green circle, and really unlikely to be a neighbor of this point if you are actually in the white part. And what I mean by that is that you will calculate something called the similarity of data point A to data point B. And this similarity score is actually a probability that A would pick B as its neighbor if neighbors were picked in proportion of this uh, Gaussian distribution, which is centered at B and has a certain variance. So this is really a probability that you calculate of uh, two points to, be, to pick uh, each other as neighbors. So if we go back to this example here, the red point is very unlikely to take the blue point or, or the blue point is very unlikely to have the red point as its neighbor because most of its neighbors should be in the red circle, a little bit less should be in the blue circle, a little bit less in the green circle. And whatever is uh, outside of this range should be very unlikely to be a neighbor of the blue point. This is what it means. And as I said, you have this variance that you are considering. So you have a Gaussian distribution, so a normal distribution around the point B. So this is the mean, and you have a certain variance. And how the variance is calculated is um, with a normal distribution and depends on the density around B. So the more cells closer to B, the lower the variance you will consider uh, in this normal distribution. So if we repeat it, you take a point A, you take another point B, you plot the normal distribution around uh, A and uh, with a certain variance and a certain, uh, and the mean being A, and you understand how the plot B is related to A by looking at where it falls in this normal distribution. So these two are very likely to pick each other as neighbors. Now, it's called the unscaled similarity because then you would do a scaling such that the points are then such that this, uh, the, the distances are adding up to one. And importantly, you also will do the little trick that actually if you calculate the similarity between A and B and the similarity between B and A, you might get different result. So it's important here to correct for that by taking the average of these two values to calculate the similarity. So most of what I said is not so important because it's the mathematics behind. What you just need to understand is that it's based on a, an assumption of distribution around the points. What you get, get at the end is a table like that where you will have a score of how close the, the points are in your original data set. And this is the picture here that I put here. 
So most of the, the blue points will pick each other as neighbors or in a normal distribution way. The red points will, take, will pick each other as neighbors in a normal distribution kind of way. And the orange points will pick each other as neighbors in a, a normal distribution kind of way. Now, what you do is that you will project randomly your points into the, the lower dimension, and you will calculate a similar distribution a similar in a similar way, who is a neighbor of who. And then you understand that you did something wrong here. These two have a, um, a very low similarity, so are not picking each other as neighbors, where in the big dimension, they do pick each other as, the, as neighbors. So you know that you need to mo move these two closer. And in each iteration, it will move the points closer to, to how they should be in the big dimension and uh, try to get to a picture that is most closely to what you have in the big dimension. And how it does that is by moving the points as close as possible. This is what I said in each iteration. But how it does that is by optim an optimization procedure. And the function that it tries to optimize is the following. Just for you to know that it's actually taking into account the similarities in the big dimension the similarities in the low dimension divides one by another and adds it up. And this is what it will try to minimize. There are parameters for TSNI. And the ones that uh, you should uh, worry about is just this one, the perplexity. The perplexity is a sort of number of neighbors to calculate the density around the points, so to understand actually the sigma parameter um, that you will use around each points in the Gaussian distribution. So this is the important parameter that will actually twist it all. So this is where you can play if you want to, to change the picture that you have. This is an interesting web page because it tries to uh, illustrate how this perplexity works and what TSNE is doing. And here you have actually the formula of the perplexity. So this is also something you can really uh, forget about if you, if you are not interested in. And what it, I want you to, to see is how the perplexity works. So perplexities is really about the number of points you will consider to be neighbors to understand the, the measure of um, the Gaussian distribution that you will assess around each point. So the variance that you will calculate around each point. So if you take a too low value, then nothing will be considered as neighbors of each other's. And you will have a, a picture that is falsely representing what you have in your original data set. And if you take a, a number that is too big, then anything will be a neighbor of anyone. And you will again get a little bit of wrong picture of what's happening in between. So the two will be too low and the hundred will be too high. In between, you actually still get the picture quite correctly of having points yellow there, points blue there, even though here you still have a sort of um, smaller cluster that appear. Uh, but here with complexity 30 or complexity 50, you get quite a nice picture of what was in your original data set. So, it's working quite nicely. What I want you to understand here is that, uh, let's say in your data set, in your original data set, you have 100 of cells, 100 of cells. Then with the perplexity of 100, you will get a completely uh, false picture. And with a complexity of two, you will also have a, a complete wrong picture. Then with a complexity in uh, with a perplexity, I say complexity a lot, but I meant perplexity. Um, you you are in a in a quite good range. So the default is thirty, and you usually do not have to change that because it's working quite nicely to separate clusters. You would have to change that if you get to a subset of cells where you would only end up with fifty cells, for instance. Then with 50 cells having a perplexity of 30, it's, it's a, again, a, a, a wrong way to do. Then one important thing about TSNE is that distances between clusters do not matter. And this is something very important to understand. This is because it's not included in the calculation of the optimization procedure. 
And since it's not included in this calculation of the optimization procedure, you will not uh, recapitulate it on the lower dimension. So here is a picture where you have actually three clusters where two of them should be a little bit closer. This is the original data set. And you can see that uh, with a perplexity of 50, you, you might actually see it a little bit. But with a perplexity of 30, everything is equal distance. So you did not uh, figure it out. Now, what's ha what happens is that we took exactly the same, I mean, they took on their, on their web page exactly the same uh, cells. It's just that they doubled the amount of cells that they have in each cluster. And now you can see that even with a perplexity of 100, you do not recapitulate this, uh, this picture of having the points uh, blue and yellow closer together. So this was about TSNI. So it's, it's, it's based on an assumption of distribution and this is what is important to remember. Now, UMAP is the other method and I think I still have a little bit of time. Yes. So UMAP is the next uh, method and it's the one which is uh, getting most popular nowadays and probably you will see at the end of this presentation why it's so popular. It stands for Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. It's nonlinear again, and it's a graph-based method. So it's graph-based and not as uh, TSNE, which is based on an assumption of the underlying distribution. Um, it is quite efficient and uh, it can use several different metrics. So this is also what is cool. But what is really nice about uh, UMAP, and this is a spoiler alert, is that it, it will define local and global distances, which will enable you to actually have also the clusters which are right, but also the distances between the clusters that will matter. And importantly, if you add new data points, it will not change the picture. It will just add these new data points. And this is not something which is true about TSNE, since if you add new data points, you would change the, the density around points. So you would change therefore the sigma of each point and therefore it will change actually the picture. So it's important to understand that. Now, about U, uh, UMAP, it was defined by these guys. So there was a mathematician, a computer theorist, and a guy computing in R, which came together to write this article. It's quite a, a complex article, but the mathematician was speaking at a conference here on this YouTube channel, on this uh, YouTube link, and it, it's quite a, uh, understandable, I think. And since uh, it was popular and understandable, he actually wrote down um, whatever he's talking about in this YouTube channel uh, in, a, in, a, in an article that he tries to describe what he says in, the, in his talk. So it's also quite nice and understandable. So it's functioning on a, a graph-based approach. And the, gra the, the graph it tries to generate is actually a higher order graph, which we call a simplicial complex. So to understand what a simplicial complex is, you just need to look at this picture. What it does, it does it, it is that it um, will say that a zero simplex is just points. A one simplex will be points and links between the points. A two simplex is actually a triangle. A three simplex will be a tetrahedron. And then you can even go to higher order, four simplex, five simplex, by uh, generating um, links between points of, of those dimensions. And a simplicial complex is just a, a, a way to link all the points that you have in your data set in a way that you have um, links between three points that will be filled with a triangle and then links between four points that will be filled with a tetrahedron. And this is what a simplicial complex is. But, um, in a computer uh, way of talking, actually this is combinatorial because you just have to represent what are the points and the links. And this is therefore very easy to implement. I mean, very easy, I wouldn't be able, I guess, <laughs> to implement. And it keeps the information of the global structure because you have a, an understanding of what should be uh, linked together in, a, in an easy way. What's mostly nice about it for me as a mathematician is that there are nice theorems that exist that will prove um, 
what kind of structure it keeps from the original space. And uh, one of the theorems that is, I'm talking about is called the nerve theorem. Now, the question is, how would you build the simplicial complex on top of your cells that you have in your data and your, and, and your uh, original data space? So this is how it works. So what it, it does is that it is, a, it is assuming an underlying object. So here, the underlying object will be this uh, wavy structure that you have here. And with that, it will um, draw unit balls with a certain metric that you can choose actually around the points. And whenever you will have two, two balls that will cross each other, then you will put a link between the, these two points. Whenever you have three uh, unit balls that will cross each other, you will actually put a triangle um, between those points. And whenever you have four, you put a tetrahedron, et cetera, et cetera. So then this is how you will actually summarize your data with a graph-like structure. And this is the graph-like structure that you will then use to, to understand how you will project the points into the lower dimension. Um, an assumption of the, the method here to summarize the data with a simplicial complex instead of taking the points is that the, the data is uniformly distributed on your underlying object. So the underlying object here will be the wavy, the wavy curve. And to, to be able to recover just with the graph, the structure of your uh, original space, you actually need to have a normal distri uh, an uniform distribution of the points on your original or underlying manifold. This is not the case because uh, data is not so nicely distributed and you don't have um, in infinite data. So they came out with a solution for this problem. And this is to vary the notion of metric and in that sense, be able to still recover the underlying manifold uh, and the distribution of the points. This is what they do with what they call fuzzy topology. And what they just do is that in re regions that are less dense, basically, they will change the uh, notion of the radius that they use. So they will not use any more a uh, unitary ball, but they will use um, a radius that is varying and with a certain range of certainty and with that understand how they should build the simplicial complex. They call this the fuzzy topology, as I said. So as you say, as you see, you have regions that are colored more dark and regions that are colored with more transparency. So if uh, balls would cross in that region, which is less um, trans uh, more transparent, there is a less certainty that there should be a link. And in places where you have actually um, the, the, the dark part or the, or the more uh, dense part of the, the balls that are crossing, then you're more certain of the link between the points. And with that, they would generate um, an idea of simplicial complex. So here it's not a simplicial complex, it's actually a directed graph because you have a link between points with a certain uh, weight um, so you can see that, for instance, you have um, the weight here is a little bit less um, important than the weight here, just because the way um, this ball crosses with this one is with the, the, the darker part, and this is how it actually works. So now they will solve the problem of having not a simplicial complex, but a directed graph by just using this formula here. This is not important to understand. Just understand that the, at the end, they get um, a notion of a graph, a simplicial complex with a link between the points and a weight between uh, the points that they have. And with that, they will understand what's the original space like. Now, to know, uh, with the theorem that they use, they actually have a se second assumption, which is that the manifold is locally connected. For you to understand that what it's doing in practice is that you cannot have isolated points in your data set. This will not happen. And what they do afterwards is that they would like to, now that they have a notion what the manifold looks like in the big dimension, 
they want to know how they can then project the points into something which is uh, human graspable, like two dimension. And what they do is this exact same idea as, um, as they do in TISNE. They would randomly project the points into the, the two dimension. They would use the fuzzy topology to calculate the, 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 the um, simplicial complex into the two dimension. And then, then they would understand how this relates to the big picture. And so this is exactly what they do. And they would calculate this formula this time to understand how close the low dimension is to the big dimension, which maybe you can see it, but this is exactly the same part or a similar part as what we see in TISNE, but they've added something else which is to be able to get the gaps right. So the distance between the points as well. And with that, uh, it's actually here is the summary. So as I said, the first phase consists in constructing um, this kind of graph in the big dimension. Then the second phase would be to be able to do an optimization procedure to be able to get the low dimension representation, so the low dimension graph, to be as close as possible to the big dimension. And this is done by uh, this uh, formula that is called cross entropy, in case you want to know. And uh, it's in enabling you to get the clumps right, but also to get the gaps right. So if we go to this picture here, what we actually end up with is that picture. So this would be projecting this two dimension into two dimension. And as you can see, it does not really represent something clearly of what we had in the big dimension. So it's important to know that it's not like PCA where it's super, where it's linear and you can very well understand what you did. Here, it's uh, not the case anymore, but knowing that the representation should get the, the clusters right and get actually the distance between the clusters as well. So in terms of parameter, there is one which is very important is a neighborhood parameter. And the neighborhood is actually a similar thing as the perplexity in TISNE. It's enabling you to get the, the neighbors correct when you go to the local metric, so the metric in the, into the low dimension. So it's, it's where you can play to understand uh, the, the clusters correctly. So this is where you could actually uh, work with if you want to um, if you want to 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 change a little bit the the output of this uh, dimensionality reduction. The rest is not so important. Maybe the min dist can also be something that you would like to to change. This is really a beauty parameter. If you have too much points one on top of the other, you could uh, make this a little bit larger, and then you have the points that would go a little bit further apart but this is uh, has nothing to do with the the lower dimension or the dimensional two reduction so now i will just show you some pictures which do compare tisne and umap such that you uh, get a sense of of how they are different and here they have several data sets where they compared the performance of tisne and umap and as you can see What's very uh, important is that UMAP is much faster. This is something to, to know. Uh, but here is how it will look like. So PCA, uh, here you have um, handwritten uh, numbers of people. So they, they had to write uh, zeros and ones and two, etc. And what you would like to cluster together is the zeros together, the one together, the two together, etc. And here is the picture of using PCA. What you can see is that the ones here are quite uh, correctly identified as a cluster. Maybe the zeros as well here somehow, uh, but the rest is quite blurred. Now TISNE understands the clusters quite correctly. As you can see, you have a super nice cluster of zero here, a super nice cluster of one here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the distances between the clusters is always uh, similar. So there is not something that you could grasp out of it. Now, if you look at your map, it's a quite a different picture because you can see that zeros are very different. They are maybe the closest to a six, but then you have a cluster forming or a subcluster forming 
of, and this is maybe cor uh, not so correct, but I say five, eight, and three. May maybe people sometimes write a three very closely to a five, I don't know. And then you have uh, here other clusters that form. It's maybe more uh, intuitive in this uh, example where um, they have pictures of fashion items. So pictures of um, uh, bags, of shirts, of sandals, of coats, etc. You can see that PCA does again perform uh, in the sense that uh, maybe uh, trousers are a bit further apart. And here maybe sneakers can be uh, well distinguished, you can you have sneakers and sandals together, but uh, everything is a little bit blurred here in the middle. TSNI does function not so bad because it does actually group together bags, for instance, it does group together um, trousers and t-shirts, etc. But the distance between the cluster is again not so representative. Whereas if we look at um, UMAP, we can see that you have a very distinct cluster forming with everything connected to the foot. So you have boots, you have sneakers, and you have sandals. And here you have uh, everything related to sh uh, shirts, I think, because you have coats, you have uh, dresses, and you have shirts, and you have tops, which are together. You have the bag, which is separate. And here on the bottom, you have everything related to uh, the, you have the trousers. So this is uh, something different. So you can see that the clusters here are, are more meaningful and the distance between the clusters are more meaningful. As I said in Surat, it's these three functions that you will have to use, run PCA, run TSNE, and run UMAP. And this is something that we can then uh, practice. So I think that was it for what I wanted to say about dimensionality reduction methods. It's uh, quite complex, but I just wanted to give you an intuition. At least what I want you to, to remember is that using only PCA is not enough because you will have only few percent of the variance that is represented by your first two components. So um, I do not want you to visualize your data only with PCA. I want you to understand that TSNE is based on uh, distribution. So this is important. And that the optimization post procedure is using, um, is uh, on, only making you having the clusters right. And UMAP is based on a geometric assumption. It's based on a graph. It's a graph based procedure. And the graph that it produces in the low dimension is supposed to look as the graph in the high dimension and the optimization procedure here is trying to optimize two things. It tries to optimize at the same time to have the clusters right and to have the graphs right. That's what I want you to remember. So that's it. I think we are uh, in the schedule quite correctly. Do you have any questions? No questions so far no. in the chat, uh, Roxanne. Yes, thank please. you very much for the explanation. It was very good. What I didn't understand yet is if you like use all of them for one data set and then you look at where you get the most information because from what I understood from you is that mainly the UMAP is the best. So why why would you use the other two? Still? Yes, so it's, it's important to know that uh, UMAP and TSNE are not interpretable. So they, they would just reduce the big dimension into low dimension and keep all the information of the big dimension, or they try to keep most of the information and put it into the low dimension. So you really need to help TSNE and UMAP in the best way possible. So you would always do PCA first before running TSNE or UMAP. So this is something important to keep in mind. We always run PCA first because it reduces the, the dimension in a way of keeping only the relevant information and having reduced the redundancy in your data set. This is not the case for UMAP and TSNE, which take just all and put all in the lower dimension, right? So therefore it's important to run PCA first. Now TSNE and UMAP, they do function in a different way because one is, has a geometric assumption and the other one a distribution assumption. So let's say if your points are very well normally distributed, then TSNE would work just fine. And as we can, we could see on the pictures, TSNE and uh, worked 
just fine to get the clusters as well. So it was just a matter of visual representation. Anything you do here is uh, to get a, a nice picture for your for your um, for your paper, right? Or a good way to look at your data. So it's not uh, what will enable you to make any conclusions. This is what we will do with clustering, for instance, or with differential expression. So at the end, if you're happy with the picture you get, you can stop there. I don't know if that answered the question. Yes, 